Good morning, everyone. How are we doing with time? Well, I'm going to leave all the thank yous um, to everyone, uh, and I hope you will accept um, the gratitude that I feel towards each one of you, those who um, are presenting and have come from so many different places, but also those who are attending today's um, field meeting. And um, actually, it's the, um, we can't even count uh, at least 13th edition of Asia Contemporary Art Week that I've organized, but this is the sixth iteration of um, field meeting. And um, it, I, I still can't believe that I'm, you know, here today, um, and it's it's actually happening. So um, because I have uh, preached um, the um, the desire for everyone to go beyond their um, limitations, psychological, mental, and otherwise, uh, and said, take field meeting as an opportunity to do something that you normally wouldn't. I've decided to do the same thing. Instead of um, telling you what I think about thinking collections and all that, because I've spent a lot of sleepless nights writing a very long curatorial narrative that you can find in the booklets that you've um, probably collected. Hopefully you have collected them um, outside. Um, I'm going to read something that I've written. Um, and it came to me um, as a, as a source of inspiration from an artist, Rashid Rana, who invited me to write um, an imaginary exhibition uh, in the future at some point in time. And um, I think it probably will say something about um, collections to you. I will leave it for you to decode. On Kings, Films, and Astral Nomads, a script for cave paintings, Sufi Fluxes production. Somewhere woven within the fabric of the universe, at an unmarked location, imperceptible to the human race and their peculiar reptilian brains, King Amanullah Khan ponders his earthly rhine during the second decade of the 20th century in Afghanistan. He's asked to evaluate himself as an interplanetary being to determine whether he is ready to join a special plane where astral nomads dwell. There he would join the energetic body, becoming one with all. However, this evaluation process requires that he converses with a crossover of consequential figures across many folds of time, so that his spirit as a being and his performance as king are most thoroughly and objectively appraised. The king is further instructed to listen silently without justifying his decisions and actions during these conversations. Alexander the Great is the first volunteer to offer his introspection, sorry, introspection for the king. He's particularly keen on discussing Amanullah's choice to send a dozen artists to study art in a place later known as Germany. The great warrior asks, why not choose a place outside your own genetic makeup where the artists could prosper more readily from their common linkage to local narratives? Japan, for example, Alexander continues, is a large body of thought that once lay somewhere between Neptune and Pluto. It is a well predicted it is well predicted that its inhabitants will invent a refined heating system, a knowledge that is forever lost, but first archived as a practice in the annals of Kabul, home integration and engineering university, fifth century AD. The system involves family members sitting together on fluffy electromagnetic floor mats and pillows around a large wooden table under which is placed a pot of hot coal. 
Large quilted comforters, generally colorful, sometimes translucent, are thrown over this table, providing up to chest level coverage for the whole family to sit under what's essentially a warm and cozy communal bliss. The offsprings of these families eventually replace the burning coal with their minds, which later baffle scientists everywhere. They somehow learn to radiate warmth by thinking about an overheated planet in an unknown galaxy called Khorasan. Surely you see how sending artists to Germany is a grave mistake on your part, given the bio, atmo, philosa, sepharic makeup of that site. They will merely become farmers harvesting terrible rice that only mimics unreality. Upon their return, they managed to open great schools across what is known as the global north, now entirely polluted by the production of the global south for generations to come before, thereafter, and in between. Eating bad rice also led to a new wave of tribalism, spreading exotic rituals rightfully known as minimalism. This, of course, is per partially due to the freezing of socialist, realist, monumental forests during the Ice Age, which back then led to conceptual art, wildfires. We all know that lines, dots, and color are the basis for reality. But where is the, fancy, the fantasy in that? Why else would banking strategists subject their analysts to think in miniature grids while plastic surrealism is filling up oceans everywhere? King Amanullah is gravely distressed by this unexpected evaluation. At the height of his wisdom, he imagines his policies were exceptionally progressive. Yet here, at the gate of a new door, He's an infant, truly perceiving that for all that his great short career allowed him to achieve, he did not know much about dancing, after all. But why, why should Alexander, a conquering adventurer himself, a local Patan, be allowed to lecture the king? He has always crit criticized Amanullah's modernist reformations throughout the ages. Perhaps a foreigner from an altogether different solar system, a woman of historical importance from the future would be a fairer evaluator. He tries to conjure Margaret Thatcher, but instead, Bibi Khadija, famously known for her heroic role as Prophet Muhammad's wise and wealthy wife, appears before him in the form of a verse. If you want the opinion of a businesswoman, you might choose someone with more pious reputation. Amanullah is taken back, but respectfully submits all his attention, aware that she has always inspired her husband's followers through her unwavering support for his chosen path. The king wondered if she thought about the quasi-yogic postures in that prescribed daily prayers for Muslims. This had occurred to him on occasion while performing his own namaz in the Mughal courts of India. To the king's surprise, Bibi Khadija's feedback is also more critical than he had hoped. She tells him she's there to warn him about his terribly unavoidable predicament to become the first person to ever hold a film camera. And that his stubborn endeavor to document fiction through the moving image will likely have him expelled from kingly ranks forever. By introducing film to society, you initiated a new exercise which is as sacred as, and as old as the sun, yet as provocative as cave paintings will become one day. Unleashing an army of filmmakers across all known planets marks the beginning of an end of globalization, it is why we will not recognize folklore in the future and why everything is reduced to food, fashion, and fasting. Yet the worst of all consequences is that airports every, everywhere will one day look and smell exactly alike. 
Having said this, Bibi Khadija quickly departs to make way for planet Uranus's notorious doctor. Two doctors, actually. Mullah Nasruddin and Joseph Boyes. Co-owners of a secret medical practice registered as Sufi Fluxus Production in the city of Ramallah's municipal library. Bibi Khadija is right, begins Mullah Nasruddin. I usually cross the other side of the river by scolding someone for being on the wrong side of it. But now suddenly I'm asked to think about and explain everything. For a sensible man like me, brainstorming is always unbearable, which is why I like to live in just one place. Because when people become accustomed to your charms, they take your wit along with them. That is how I've gained my fame across so many planes, geographies, and languages, proving my genius without much effort. What Nasruddin is saying, interjects voice, is that filmmaking and residency programs become synonymous with righteous individualism. Constant questioning of one's condition, as opposed to standing by one's conviction, exemplifies a bird gone astray forgetting to fly. It goes against the hidden order of the cosmos. It moves away from spiritual evaluation and is a negation of our animal idealism. But before I go on, my premonition is that you will likely meet Rustam, the champion of Shahnama, the Book of Kings. You will meet him soon. He is the reincarnate as he, he is to reincarnate as a shaman in the Mexican-American border, in the Mexican-American frontier. Rustam already has had much experience working with ancient Assyrian psychotherapists to heal one of the gravest illnesses affecting all universal planes. The Mayan calendar calls this illness stress. The Mohegans called it the disease for overthinkers. I'm convinced that muralists, when one day learn how to paint emotion, will rid Homo sapiens off of this lurking condition. Nasruddin, who was listening intently up to this point, abruptly interrupts Boyce's monologue. Let us get back to our evaluation. Sending artists for art residencies abroad and making films, in my opinion, are examples of sheer backwardness. Who is stupid enough to give up counting stars at night? A wonderful, relaxing occupation. Who will, who will allow their household donkeys to be replaced by imperfect, imperfectly reliable apps such as ways for navigation? Here, Boyce interrupts Nasruddin to enter a lengthy discussion about the king's actual list of merits. They're both particularly impressed by Excuse me, I want to make sure I'm, I have time still. They're both particularly impressed by his abilities to raise an air force, build major dams, decree women to wear high heels, expel the British Martians out of cyberspace, which initiated the loosening of the colonial grip throughout the whole Siberian and African continents. Nasruddin and Boyce jointly agree, again, that Amanullah is overly a visionary, courageous, and just king. However, they dispute the methodology by which they could raise his score so that he can indeed enter the plains of astral nomads. They have mixed feelings about his readiness. Boyce feels what would be most impactful would be for the king to call on curators from Samarkand, Bukhara, Delhi, and Lisbon to stage an interplanetary Chinese opera. He argues that the emotional charge of this newly emerged self-expression could possibly purge the universe from all left-wing traumatic policies. Nasruddin disagrees with such a plan. This would be too easy. Why bail out a despot, an exiled king? Recall that such a plan does not reverse the planetary shifts that were set in motion by his negligent actions. We must contemplate whether such actions are irreversible. Do you think planet Mars is not affected when we smoke camels down here? So, Amanullah must wake up. 
to the sound of his faithful interference with destiny, resonating disharmony throughout Jahan, perhaps for eons. For your information, the Queen of Sheba has recently offered a major grant for astrophysicists to study the effect of human action on black holes. Well, I can't finish because that would mean I would go over time. So I will leave the end of the story to your imagination. Thank you. <laughs>